Markus Müller in Maria Becker. Um, Markus Müller is a senior uh, uh, lecturer at the University of Heidelberg. And Maria Becker is a research associate in, uh, in the project on discourse that funded by, uh, yes, the German well, um, should we go for a coffee break? Yeah, yeah. 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 But we have no time actually for it. <laughs> you only. According to, my, according to my still we have, we have no time. We have just 30 minutes of each presentation, and when we have a coffee break, then we have to cut at the uh, presentations. <laughs> I think, I think we just go after this presentation, we go for a quick five minutes, get a coffee, and then come back for, for the last presentation. Is this okay? And then we still have one hour and a half for presentations. Yeah. So it's we have three presentations back. We have five minutes for a quick coffee and then come back for the last presentation too. Yeah. <laughs> we still have two presentations, right? Three. But then we missed the break. Three. 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 So after the coffee. Four presentations. So let's go for a coffee. No. Ten minutes and then we'll yes. uh, If you decide how. Uh, uh, <laughs> actually, we have. We have okay. uh, I thought we were going to do a presentation, then have a coffee, and then have a discussion. Is this okay for you? No. <laughs> 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 uh, just, just in five minutes, just for the five minutes. Why should we? So let's have the coffee now. Yes, okay. Yeah. Okay. So can you check if you can come back? Because they still have the coffee. coffee. So, okay, okay, so we do a presentation. So the then we have three presentations finished. This is 50%. Then we have three presentations after this coffee break. So we can shorten the coffee break, right? Yes, we should. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, so we are very sorry that we can get no coffee now. And I think um, we have to take some coffee afterwards. And here, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming today. And we are going to present you the results of our research in Epistemic Discourse and the Communicative Procedures of Establishing Identity and Alternity in Epistemic Cultures. Um, first of all, I want to give you a brief overview of our presentation with some short introduction and explain some uh, special key terms. And then we're going to introduce our corpus, which consists of panel discussions recorded at interdisciplinary conferences at the University of Heidelberg. Um, then we are going to give you some examples um, of communicative procedures of the rebroachment and differentiation of epistemic cultures through, um, yes. Um, then we are going to embed um, our results in a theoretical background. And um, then we want to um, introduce our new project called Discourse Lab, which deals with questions of transcultural um, research. Yeah, we start with uh, with some key questions um, uh, concerning some key terms um, dealing with communicative procedures in epistemic cultures and with the interaction between different academic scholars raise a couple of those questions. For example, how do academic scholars interact in this context? How do scholars use academic disciplines as a resource in social positioning? and how is social identity in science is made, and then the connection between social identity and epistemic cultures. We will come back to that later. Um, the last question um, is what we can learn about the specific ways in which scientific knowledge is built in different epistemic cultures. 
Yeah, um, we think that the concept of social identity is very useful in the research field of epistemic cultures and transculturality. Um, we will come back to this concept later. First of all, here we want to give a short definition by Peter Auer, who states that social identity is clearly a useful mediating concept between language and social structure. On the one hand, it allows one to see interactions uh, as being involved in linguistic acts of identity through which they claim or ascribe group membership, or more preciously, through certain speaking styles. And on the other hand, membership categories can be regarded as constituting members' knowledge and perception of social structures. And now we are moved to the empirical part of our presentation, we analyzed the question how academic scholars interact in this interdisciplinary context and how social identity in science is made. Um, we did this on the basis of five panel discussions in German language recorded at interdisciplinary conference at the University of Heidelberg. Um, they have a total length of about eight hours and 11 minutes. But because they are in German language, we will give you um, a translation um, as well. Um, in these discussions, scholars of various disciplines take part, for example, molecular biologists, historians, or theologians, as well as linguists, and they discuss uh, topics like life or facticity as key terms in science. We partially transcribed them using the folk editor um, invented at UPS um, in Mannheim at the Institute for German Language and the minimal transcription method of Gatsby's one. So we are coming to our data. Um, first of all, we want to give you some examples of the approachment of epistemic culture through community procedures. And um, we sum this um, category up under the label establishing common ground. As time is short, I will present most of the categories quite briefly and illustrate each of one or two examples of our data. We level our first category with the subscription modeling basic knowledge, which means establishing common ground, for example, in stating explicit, explicitly that there is a common knowledge about a specific topic among the participants. Like here, a phys a physicist says, Newtonish mechanic, um, all of you know that. Um, by the way, I don't think that um, all of the audience will know what uh, um, the Newtonish mechanic um, or Newtonish me mechanics um, does uh, mean. Yeah. Another way um, of the reversion of epistemic cultures is the valuing of other disciplines in the light of their own, which often is accompanied with the downgrade of their own scientific discipline. And we will show you this with a um, longer transcript, and it's also on your handout, as well as the transcription um, conventions. Uh, it's transcript one because it says I'm not wise in principle. In this way, 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 also die mit den Menschen untersucht oder die Sprache oder gar die Funktionsweise des Gehirns, äh, die haben so den Unterschied schwerer. Das ist, ist ganz klar. Das ist ja, also ich glaube, das äh, weiß hier jeder der Physiker, sind also nicht prinzipiell früher als wir. Ich habe einen Wissenschaftler, sondern wir arbeiten eben an, an einem, äh, äh, wie sagen Sie, günstigeren Objekt. <lacht> Yeah, the uh, speaker is the physicist Blatt, who is talking here about academic scholars who have to deal with complex systems and who struggle with very difficult topics while his own discipline, the physics, works on more favorable objects. 
it might reasonably assume that a complex research object refers to an ambitious discipline, and therefore this can be analyzed as an expression of appreciation of other scientists or sciences, and in the sense also as downgrade of his own discipline. Our next category um, we label by establishing the general category, academic scholar like here. Um, it's a set an, uh, an academic scholar is someone who reflects on some topic. And um, in talking about uh, the category academic scholar, um, the, um, uh, the common features are emphasized and the differences are established. Besides um, the communicative resources of the reproachment of academic cultures, they can be also identified communicative procedures of differentiation um, of epistemic cultures. One of them is presuming um, ignorance from the recipients. Um, in this example, um, it's, uh, I think, a psychologist who says, um, who talks about um, subjective facts. And he says, well, it is a term I think I have to explain a bit. Of course, it is not so obvious at all what a subjective fact is supposed to be. And um, we see that this is quite the opposite of the, um, what um, the physicist uh, told about the Newton mechanics in our other example. Um, so he is presuming ignorance and um, not knowledge from his recipients. Our next category is defining the own competence area and distinguish, distinguishing it from those of other scientists. Um, in our example, this can be illustrated. Um, here the speaker, um, a physicist again, answers the question of a linguist about the impact of language on knowledge. And she says, um, besides, I can probably contribute very little about this topic, about the topic of language and the impact of language on uh, knowledge, but um, he says about formulas as a type of language, I could say something. Perhaps. Our next category is establishing specific, specific categories like physicist or linguists. Um, which is quite contrary to the previously discussed establishment of the general category academic scholar. Um, special categories can be either attributed to oneself, as in our first example, um, the physicists, to us, um, like we saw in transcript one, um, as well as um, attributed to others. Um, what do you, as a physicist, mean by facts and authenticity? So our last example deals with the contrasting different definition of key terms. Um, definition different, different, different definition, sorry, of key terms, or simply of terms seem to be a very common problem in transcultural epistemic discourse as this phenomena often occurs in interdisciplinary discussions, and you might also know that. So um, our transcript two deals with this question. Führen es in anderen Faktenbegriffe ab. Sie führen es in anderen Faktenbegriffe ein. Das halten wir hier vor. Das ist ein kommunikativ, das kommunikativ, kommunikative Faktum. Ja, das ist natürlich eine andere Definition. Um, here we see the collision of different definitions of the um, term fact between a linguist who claims the existence of a communicative factor, which seems to be uncommon in his dialogue partner, the physicist. So, um, 
So now we move on to that I'm going to say a few words on the specific view we have on this, uh, this data and uh, some theoretical uh, and organization uh, background. So uh, we look at these data or as um, examples of linguistic well behavior. So I've um, done studies, quantitative corpus linguistic studies on linguistic well behavior, and this is. Um, what we're doing now is an interaction around the approach to the same uh, topic. So linguistic role behavior in this uh, context means that scholars from various academic disciplines um, go back to their disciplines and take the habits, the social practices of their, um, of their academic background as a resource of uh, communication, of interaction, hybrid classroom context and interdisciplinary context and uh, yes. uh, so and having this uh, view on the data we can distinguish two types two cultural patterns of uh, practicing acting as a scientist in these uh, hybrid cultural contexts and we've named these um, types in terms of political theory just to say something familiar to you. <laughs> <laughs> First category we've named uh, the hegemonic discourse and uh, what we mean by uh, saying this is uh, uh, describing a habit of establishing a context of identity by modeling a common knowledge according to the own scholarly practice. So this is what uh, Robert Seneca calls uh, presupposition accommodation. Uh, if you take the example we've already uh, discussed, uh, Newtonian mechanics, well, all of you know that. So maybe there's a philosopher who stands up and says, I don't have a clue of Newtonian mechanics, but it would rarely happen. So this is uh, a practice of imposing you know, the the own basic knowledge of the own um, discipline to the whole hybrid context. And uh, if you uh, look at the other example, uh, what, what's happening there is that uh, always the physicist uh, describes the disciplines like linguistics, like psychology, in terms, in concepts of his own academic background, like um, languages are complex systems. and. So it's hard to draw out theories from that because systems are so complex. So uh, this is to say linguists fail <laughs> in doing their work, but it's not their fault because you know, the topic is too complex. So this is a physicist's view on our material. Maybe it's right, but that's not the point. So uh, the second type we want to discuss, uh, we've uh, called it the isolationism discourse. So it's kind of opposite habit you may have in interdisciplinary contexts, like drawing a line, um, building up a border between, you know, my conceptual world as a linguist and your conceptual world as a social theorist. So, and to say, so these are my concepts, these are my definitions, these are yours, and that's okay. Let's stay with this. So this is isolationism, of course, in interdisciplinary <coughs> contexts. Uh, so just to give a brief <coughs> summary, uh, we see that uh, academic scholars incorporate their disciplines in these interdisciplinary fields, spaces, and uh, interdisciplinary contexts can be regarded as hybrid cultural spaces in which uh, you know different disciplinary forms and practices come together and sometimes clash together, but they can regard it also as kind of incubators of new transcultural practices in science. Uh, and like, uh, uh, if you look at this, what we're doing here, and uh, if, we, if you agree that we are interested in discourse analysis, and maybe this is kind of work of a new material, like the discourse, interdisciplinary discourse analysis. So, 
this is the second view on uh, the topic. And if you have a wider look, uh, looking at uh, you know, the production of scientific knowledge, um, you and uh, you have a uh, perspective. We have you might say that scientific knowledge is a kind of byproduct of identity work scientists do in you know talking with each other and cooperating with each other. And this was what comes out as a byproduct is science. So to give this slide is to give you know the sense <laughs> uh, to give the theoretical background once we say anything just uh, uh, this is uh, Google and from you so um, the frequencies in, in Google books and see uh, the, the fashion social practice which uh, increases and increases and increases in books um, and uh, with a peak in the year 2001 and then it increases again so we need to make really increase in the curve of social practice. <laughs> If you write a book, just write one time social practice. <laughs> uh, so, uh, to say a few words on uh, the organizational background we're working in, uh, being interested in this kind of uh, this kind of uh, topic, we've, uh, we're building up a, a, a infrastructure, virtual research and teaching platform, which uh, we call Discourse Lab, and the aim is to uh, to make possible intercultural and interdisciplinary work in the field of discourse analysis. And uh, so this is uh, the first aim. And the second aim is to do research on that's what's happening on the platform and do research like this we're presenting here. And so we have a kind of monitoring <coughs> project uh, with the child becoming transcultural, how does that transcultural cultural practice in science arise and we hope to get a better understanding of what it does mean so to cooperate in the disciplinary context in science in general and in discourse analysis in a specific. So this is it. Thank you very much. Before we start our discussion, um, I've had a look at the time frame and we really have 50 minutes for a coffee break. So that's fine. Um, yeah. Questions. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have I, an additional question. Additional. Uh, you were uh, saying about uh, collaboration between participants, uh, and I'm interested in the following: uh, Is there interest to transcript any uh, specific topic in that that collaboration stands out, or? in that uh, or any situation in that we can uh, be speaking uh, about uh, inter-identity um, inter dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, um, yes, there is, but so um, you have to have a close look on, on things. So this was happening here is that people meet um, for the first time. So, and then there's the physicists, and then there's a philosopher, a sociologist, a psychoanalyst, a linguist, and then they they have to find a common language. That's hard to do. Of course, they all speak German, but that's not very helpful in this <laughs> And so they, uh, they uh, go back, they, they recur to their, their their life, and their selves, and their beings, and the, the things they say normally, and uh, so they try <laughs> saying it, and then they get a reaction, and uh, so in this mode, and you know, kind of hybrid identity is established in the room, but it's always, uh, you know, a, it's a dynamic uh, thing, a very uh, transitive very fluent, um, but then um, I've um, worked on a bioethics discourse. We have a situation in which um, it's interdisciplinary again, but um, you have a series of debates in, in uh, political fora, in television, on radio, and in academia, in which uh, 
always the same people meet. <laughs> and then you can see that there are kind of, uh, you know, transcultural identities being formed and they find a common language. But if you have even a closer look and then you see that in this language go in, so uh, disciplinary practices, so it's a kind of a hybrid uh, language of intercultural or interdisciplinary discourse. But there is an effort to establish some kind of positive uh, producing to to, to discuss, to talk. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's what it's Thank you. Thanks. Nice. This project presents a lot of overlap with our project on academic discourse, and um, especially the question of the role of identity work. Um, I like this form there that the way the knowledge is by product and these identity processes. And um, the one question I would have, because I've done a lot of interviews, is I mean, the underlying idea I think here was that there's a kind of disciplinary community with some kind of more or less homogeneous basis of understanding. And then you have these interdisciplinary academy campus where they have to negotiate these differences. And I wonder whether this is the case every time anybody encounters other researchers or academics. Um, in my interviews, I saw very clearly that Everybody has a very sophisticated, very unique, and very kind of special knowledge um, in whatever field and um, about everything. Um, I mean, we're studying only social sciences and humanities, so linguists would think about language, culture, politics, society, everything, and same thing for food sciences. But the big difference is not maybe in the way. Um, in the nature of the knowledge they have, but much more as you say, in the way that certain areas of this knowledge is is flagged out as legitimate. So what you can really see is a kind of different legitimacy kind of barriers for certain fields that they feel they can be freely talked about because they're publicly recognized as experts. Yeah. Whereas other fields which where they have lots of ideas and they know the they're just very shy, and, and I think what happened, what happens in this academic um, positioning game is you have these disciplinary walls that don't really reflect certain knowledge boundaries, but legitimate boundaries, and, and in a way, it's a system that creates certain positions where people can make certain claims with more kind of assurance than others, but everybody knows about very many and very different Yeah, I agree with you. But it's a matter of, basically it's a matter of context, so where it's not only the question who you are and you know, your background, but so it's of the interaction situation. So that as Beato Eco says, when I was in Milan in Italy, when I'm in Rome, I'm in North Italian. When I'm in Berlin, I'm Italian. When I'm in New York, I'm European. So and this is it. Um, of course, we know that there's no linguistic identity, or no identity of linguists, because the, the Chomsky guys and the Foucault guys and the others and structuralism and so on. We, we play this game <laughs> between linguists, but then when you talk to a physicist, <laughs> So it's you, you, you become a linguist, so in, in general, so this is your identity, which is uh, brought about in the context. I agree with you. Um, I, I'd like to ask something about the relations between these disciplines. Because on the one hand, you have different disciplines, and each of these disciplines has something they are doing research on. And on the other hand, and they are all the same. But on the other hand, uh, the physicians uh, cannot speak about social sciences, as you showed us, but the social or the cultural sciences, as we can speak about what the physicians are doing. So there is a there is some kind of um, uh, hegemonic relationship of the other kind, um, because uh, you are speaking, we are speaking about others, and we are with our notions like identity and all of these. We can say what they are, what they are doing. 
can define their own language as an idiom, but they cannot because they have no language in their expert on their expert level to speak about what uh, English is like. What do you think about this language? I think you're right, but this is only our view. So uh, if you change the position, the physicist would say, you can uh, you know, define me, but this doesn't matter. <laughs> so this is not important to society, and this is not important to me. <laughs> you know, my, my father-in-law is a physicist, and I, I love him, and he loves me, but uh, 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 sometimes we, we, we talk about our work, and uh, he tells me, oh, I appreciate very much what you what you're doing as a linguist, and as I appreciate poetry, so it's very <laughs> important for society. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So there are not all uh, scientists think like this, but there are a lot of people who really do not appreciate social science and uh, linguistics. So, and uh, this is, you know, the other, the other view, the other part of uh, the other side. Of the situation, so I don't think uh, it's uh, taken take a, a view uh, uh, you know, uh, from from above. There's there's a hegemonic situation here. <coughs> me, I don't know. Before we take our coffee, we have two more questions. Um, I think we just put together and then we go. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, let's try. Um, I think uh, a question to your to your research strategy. Um, you have uh, you have a videos with uh, different scientists, and uh, are you also studying the context of these uh, of these uh, uh, speeches or identity construction processes? Because what I just remember your your, your isolation strategy. This can also be a strategy which which uh, stops communication, but it can be also be a useful strategy in order to start communication because I am a social scientist, you are a linguist, let's talk about discourse, for example. Yeah? Um, so, are, are you also, uh, are you just doing interviews or, or, or are you doing some of your research? Or? Um, we, we ask ourselves uh, this question too, but we don't really know what we are doing. It's I think it's something between conversation analysis and discourse analysis um, without um, interviews, without additional interviews. Um, we just uh, take this context we have in these uh, talks, and then we um, we took out examples, ex extracts examples, and uh, analyze them with the methods of conversational analysis. And we think uh, this. Um, we believe that uh, what we can say about um, doing um, <coughs> doing transcultural DT in this context lies within the these discussions themselves, and a social identity is produced in these discussions. <coughs> so you, you reflect also on the context of interviews? Like no, 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 but uh, we haven't done interviews, so these no, are, no. are, these these are, are not interviews, discussions. these are panel discussions, it's all panel discussions. Ah, okay. yes. yeah, yeah. We recorded panel discussions, yes. so we haven't uh, talked with these okay. people. And these panel discussions, we, uh, we they were recorded at um, conferences at Heidelberg mm -hmm. um, without, uh, for a special, without a special purpose. Um, we just <coughs> could uh, take them and analyze them afterwards, but they were recorded not for a special uh, issue. Okay. Yes. Just one short question to the coffee. Um, we're talking about um, hegemonic discourses when somebody says, as we all know, uh, isn't this just a rhetoric strategy? And where would be the difference? Why? What's your understanding of this course in that case? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, this course, uh, in, in this um, sense of the word, is a, um, an emergent structure from social practices. So uh, we, we practice communication in interaction, and we do this because uh, we, we are used to it in a certain context. So um, and there uh, we have a series of social practices uh, in, uh, which are similar one to each other. And uh, uh, this is uh, to be understood by the interactants themselves because there's an emergent structure which can be uh, which can be perceived as a category, so as a community category to, to react to. And this is discourse. Thank you. Thank you.
and the point that we started the previous presentation in in 50 minutes, yeah? Is it okay? So at 10 to 